Uh, I'm Dave Miklos. I'm here with Nicole King and Seth Grant, and we're talking about how organisms become more complex. Nicole, you're interested in a group of microorganisms that border on the edge of multicellularity. Could you tell us what that organism is and what you've found out about how unicellular things can potentially become more complex? Sure. We're in the, we've been interested in understanding how the first animals evolved. And it turns out that, that the most important first step was the acquisition of multicellularity. That is, how is it that, that ancestral organisms that were strictly single-celled evolved the ability to have cells remain together in a coordinated way so that their functions actually um, were synergistic as opposed to competitive. And it turns out what, what we're learning is that much of the, the genetics, the molecular machinery that allows those cells to interact cooperatively evolved early in the single-celled organisms for other functions and then were co-opted to serve functions of allowing cells to communicate and adhere to each other. And so it's this exciting example in which all the equipment was there and then it had to be um, activated in a, a particular way to allow the, the cells to become multicellular. And that's the, the earliest step of the acquisition of complexity on the road to becoming a, a complex multicellular animal. And just tell us some of the major classes of molecules that were present in unicellular organisms that were needed to, say, build an animal. Sure. So, so we think of three or four particular functions uh, that are required to have a, a stable and complex multicellular organism. And these are molecules that are required to hold cells together, adhesion genes, um, cells or molecules that allow cells to communicate, and these are signaling molecules. And these typically are a receptor on one cell and maybe a secreted protein from another. Um, and then in terms of having cell differentiation, there needs to be ways to allow different sets of genes to be turned on in one cell versus another. So these would be transcription factors, proteins that bind to special places on the uh, genome to turn genes on and off. And the final class of genes are those that um, are on the cell surface and allow the cells to attach to a secreted matrix called the extracellular matrix. And we find representatives of all of those types of components in the single-celled coanoflagellates. These are the organisms that are the closest living relatives of animals. Now, Seth, you work on a similar problem, but put a finer point on this. So Nicole has found that some of the elements needed to become a multicellular animal were present in single-celled organisms. And you've found a similar thing with the nervous system. So if you could say how that relates to Nicole's work. Oh, it relates very closely because the brain is considered to be the most cellularly complex organ known, particularly the mammalian brain, made of billion nerve cells. And if one examines how those cells connect to one another, you'll find exactly the kinds of molecules that are important that Nicole has just told us about. And in evolutionary comparisons of the molecules that are found even in the human brain and the junctions between those nerve cells, you will discover that it is those adhesion proteins that Nicole mentioned, as well as those that interact with the extracellular matrix, and also the signaling proteins. And these are amongst the key components of the junctions called synapses between nerve cells. And just if you would tell us a bit about the experiment that showed um, what, why that was so, that, that that machinery or that toolkit had been developed over a period of time? I think the background to this is that everybody thinks of the brain as a super specialized organ, which it is, specialized for behavior, and behavior is the interaction with the environment. And what we did was to study the composition of these junctions between nerve cells called synapses, and we did this using a, a special kind of biochemistry. And what we found was a large number of proteins in mouse synapses. And when we examined where they came from in evolution, by comparing them, the genes that are found in the mouse to those that are found in the organisms, such as those that Nicole and others have studied, we found, much to our surprise, that a very large proportion of synapse proteins are found in animals that don't even have any nerve cells at all. In fact, they only are made of single cells. And it is this sort of machinery which is at the ancestry of the synapse and thus our mental processes. Uh, now what if you try to relate what a single-celled or a colonial organism like yours does uh, 
to thinking. What would be some of the analogs of what these proteins are doing in the single-celled organism, say, versus our brain? Right. Well, I think one of the, the one of the things we forget about single-celled um, eukaryotes is that they're they're living in a complex and ever-changing environment. So one of the things that these single cells need to be able to do is to to interpret and respond to many different types of cues. And, and so many of the types of molecules we've been talking about are probably um, used in a way that allows them to determine um, over here are a particular type of bacteria that we like, or over here there might be some pathogens, it's, it's too cold here, it's, you know, you can do a variety of different environmental cues. And so, um, so those are the types of challenges that single-celled organisms face. Now, my understanding in the brain is that, um, that part of the source of complexity is the ability to um, send and interpret many different types of stimuli. And the cells are interacting, and some of the complexity, if I understand correctly, comes from the very different types of receptors and signaling molecules that are, um, that are um, interacting. And so uh, recognizing and appreciating that the, the basic machinery for the molecules that, um, that underlie complexity in the brain actually evolved very early and understanding that they probably evolved in order to, to allow a, a seemingly simple organism deal with a very complex environment might help us understand um, some of the evolutionary foundations for, for the evolution of something as insanely <laughs> complex as that. Yeah, I, I would go one step further and just return to an observation that was made in the 19th century by a scientist called Lloyd Morgan, and he pointed out that all animals need to respond and interact with their environment, perhaps obvious, but he pointed out that the mechanisms that may be found in single-celled animals may be the same kinds of mechanisms that exist even in humans, and this was supposed back in the 1890s. And I think one of the, the beautiful things is that we've now found that there is a unity, a sort of a common origin to those molecular principles, and they are deeply rooted in the origins of multicellularity, which pertains to the most complex organ, uh, the brain. Now you both have used the term toolkit in yes. talking about the proteins that are needed to do things. So if you'd comment just on what you mean by a toolkit and right. what do you mean by a toolkit? Well, I, I think the idea here, and, and the toolkit is a, a catchphrase for thinking about the structural molecules that underlie the biology of an organism. So th these, we, we talk about proteins, and then within proteins we talk about protein domains, which are um, uh, uh, interlocking modules, each of which has an independent function. And so you can say for this given organism, it has this suite of, of structural molecules. Now the toolkit can be implemented in different ways, and so the regulation of how those genes um, uh, how genes and proteins are, are enacted is a, is a different question. So we can say uh, uh, all of these components, these tools are available, now how are we going to use them? What are the directions? And, and so by having a more sophisticated set of directions, you might have a more complex biology, even though the same tools are in place in, in the two different scenarios. Yeah, I think of the toolkit which is the proteins, is the proteins who after all do everything, even though they're encoded by DNA. But it's like a Lego kit. You get a small Lego kit when you're a young child and it has these nice colored boxes, blocks of different shapes and you can build all these wonderful things and you love it so much that next time Christmas comes around, you get an even bigger set with all these extra bits and pieces. And that's essentially what one has got with these higher, uh, greater multicellular animals. You get a bigger molecular tool set. And in the case of the nervous system, the molecular tool set that all of us vertebrates have is actually much bigger. It's the, it's, it's the giant Lego set compared to the little one, which all of our insect and other simpler organism cousins have. And that's why we have much more sophisticated nervous systems, because we can build much bigger things with our enormous Lego kit.